seated. Thank you so much for joining us for worship today here at the warehouse. Uh, we have a lot going on in the church, so make sure you uh, pay attention to the bulletin uh, for a special thing that we're doing today. Uh, in case you're not aware of it, uh, Kenneth Johnson has been a long time member and attender of especially this service. Uh, Kenneth uh, is having major medical issues and he's been wanting to come to church and just can't come. So we have decided that after the service today, we're going to go over to his house and do, I'm calling it like a mini service. Uh, we're going to just do a few songs. Peter's going to say a few, a few words. And uh, you have an opportunity to talk to Kenneth if you want to or, or, or give him a hug or whatever. If you do that, we're going to ask that you wear a mask. We'll have some masks over there. Um, so right after this service, if that's something you want to uh, be involved in, we're going to go to Kenneth's house. It's on Harney Street. I'm terrible with directions. This way. Right down here on the left. Uh, if you know where Mike Briggs lives, Ken Kenneth lives right next door to Mike Briggs. So you can pay attention and follow. Basically, we're just going to stand in his yard and do this. I'm thinking 15 or 20 minutes, just something so we can show our love and support for KJ. Um, we're going to have an issue if, if a lot of people come with parking. So uh, if you can carpool, that would be helpful. So just, you know, pile up in a few cars out here and go, and somebody can bring you right back to the church, literally like two minutes away. So uh, this is something we want to do uh, for KJ. Um, and, and, and wish him well, pray for him. And so uh, please join us at, right after this service over at Kenneth's house. And like I say, we're thinking like 15 or 20 minutes. So you can get on with your day. If you want to go to the 11 o'clock service, you should have plenty of time to get back and go to that. So again, right down Harney Street, this way, carpool right after this service. We're going to leave and, and go straight over there. Um, all the other announcements are in your bulletin. Pay attention to your Wednesday night. Schedule. We had our first uh, family night supper on Wednesday night. Um, I thought it was very well attended. The food was great. The message from Peter was great. We have started our youth and children back. Uh, I don't know how many kids we had, but I walked in the door and got mauled by a whole pack of children. So uh, we had a great turnout, I thought, for the first day of the children's program. Uh, we are spending a lot of time as a church on that program. So if you have a child or a grandchild or know a child, please invite them to attend that. And that's at 4.30 on Wednesday. So that will continue this week. So pay attention to that. For your offering today, buckets and baskets are on your back table. A basket is for your tithe to the church or your offering. You can also give through Venmo. And uh, your, your uh, we have buckets back there for change or loose bills. We use that money for missions in the community. And we do do a lot of good in the community. Uh, with that money. So uh, we're going to watch a video. We're going to do one more song. Then Peter's going to come up and lead us in the baptism, which we're very excited about. And then he'll share the message with us. So after this video, we have one more song.
Before we begin, let's take, we're going to take some pictures, right? Let's get some pictures. Okay, there you go. Awesome. There you go, you're smiling. Okay, you're not going to be smiling. Well, maybe not. Um, in our tradition, we, 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 we do baptism in the sense of covenant. In the early, early years of um, Judaism, God made a covenant with his people and he would ratify it with each baby that came to him under the Jewish form of circumcision. And uh, we're glad we don't have to do that anymore. Now we just do baptism. <laughs> and so that's what we're going to do this morning. Um, so, usually I have a book, but I don't have the book, so I'm going to loosely follow what's in the book of our, our Book of Worship, and I have to ask you a few questions, and uh, the answer is I do, or I, uh, with God's grace I do, but we'll just do, I do. So the first is, do you renounce evil 
in this world in all the forms um, that we find it. Do you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Okay. Then, will you lead your life in such a way that Ethan will learn what it means to be a Christian and at that time that he's able to choose Christ as his own personal Lord and Savior? Awesome. Okay. That's important. So now, Ethan, let me hold you for a while. And, oh boy, you've been eating, boy. <laughs> okay. Ethan? Oh, this water's cold. I'll just make some warm water. Okay. Ethan, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, I'm going to take him around and show him a little bit, okay, because I meet his new family. But before I do that, dear church, Will you support Ethan and the Squire's family as they raise him? Will you teach him Sunday school? Will you show him what it means to live a godly life until that time that he can accept Christ for himself? Will you support this family in their Christian endeavors and help them when they're struggling and celebrate in their joys? We do. Amen. All right, welcome to our church and let me introduce you to a new member. This fellow over here, he'll take you fishing and he'll take you bow hunting and you need to get to know him because he makes some of the best fried chicken in the church. Okay. Now this fellow over here, he got candy and these boys and girls, they'll let you sit with them, okay? And that little girl over there is my daughter and she'll take you horse riding if she will, okay? And some of these other folks, they'll aggravate you till death and make sure that you come to church. And you see, when you get old enough, you'll get to meet this lady over here, and she will teach you all about Jesus. And then when you get ever bigger and you become a teenager, you need to get to meet this couple, because guess what? They're going to teach you about Jesus as a grown young person. And those folks over there, they will try and get you to come to their house and visit, and he might even teach you how to play the guitar. Welcome to our church. Thank you so much. Feel free at the end of to shake their hands and make them feel welcome. Um, as you're going out towards um, the, the, the family we're going to visit, thank you for coming. I like the name Ethan. I, I asked them what's the middle one of them, and we got Max Squires, like in Maximus, you know. I um, I dreamt that if I ever had a boy, I was going to call him Wolfgang. Wolfgang, you know, I just get that. Awesome name, Wolfgang. I'm a Deus, you know. After some of my favorite musicians. By the way, if, uh, if you play some of the old classical stuff on a liquid guitar, sounds pretty awesome. Uh, this morning, I want to talk to you about a um, subject that I think has become too uh, nicely polypacked in our church. Um, you know, when we go to the community shops and that, we all get those pretty little crosses. And so when I talk about the cross of Jesus, we all think in terms of those kind of cute little things you can get. But that's not the cross that we're talking about. Um, in our text this morning, Mark's Gospel, chapter 8, verse 27, 38, Jesus says, take up your cross, deny yourself, and follow me. And that's my text this morning, to take up your cross and follow me. And the reason I chose that because I think sometimes we think Christianity is a place where we come to get entertained. Christianity is a place where we come to get something done to us. But that's not what Jesus intended. In fact, when Jesus first started preaching, everybody came to him because he healed them. He fed them free fish and bread. And later on, he said, but there's a deeper part to Christianity. And that is, I want you to take up your cross and follow me. Well, guess what? Those folks back there knew a little bit about the cross of Jesus. They knew something about crucifixion because it was done publicly. 
and it was done on the outskirts of the town on the main roads where everybody got to see it and so they were very familiar with what crucifixion was about. It was invented by the Persians, apparently they had better uses for their oil. They used to burn people in oil and then they stopped doing that and then they started putting people on um, spikes and the people died too quickly and they wanted it to be torturous and, and, and have a better effect so they prolonged it by putting you on a cross. And the Romans said, you know, that's a good idea. You know, they didn't want to have their armies in every single town, they just wanted a few people but they needed to scare the town enough so that they wouldn't try and challenge Rome and the peace of Rome. So they came up with this thing called the cross. And they had different ways of actually crucifying people. Sometimes they would use a tree with, like this. Um, sometimes they would use rope. Uh, sometimes they would use two nails in the hands and one in, the, um, in your arm. Sometimes they would put your feet at the bottom on the sides. Um, but the whole purpose of it was to make your death cruel and unusual. In fact, one of my questions when I get to heaven is, Jesus, out of all the types of crucifixion and all the times in the world you could have come to earth to die for our sins, why did you choose at that time? I mean, you could have come and got the electric chair in America, or you could have got the guillotine, uh, you, you could have been shot, uh, you could have had a lethal injection. Um, there's many ways you could have been killed for our sins, but you chose the cross. And I wonder why. And I'm going to sort of answer it, what I think Jesus might tell me. So, when Jesus was being crucified, the whole purpose of being crucified was to tell everybody else that this man was a threat to Rome, this man was a threat to Rome's peace, and that he was causing way too much trouble in Jerusalem and around Israel. In fact, the year that Jesus was crucified, we can read in secular documents that actually there were three messiahs that were killed. Jesus wasn't the only one. So they were quite wary of this. Also, you can actually find articles in uh, Cicero, Josephus and others that talk about Jesus' crucifixion and how terrible it was. One of the things we find out in crucifixion, just as depicted in the Bible, that crucifixion had two parts to it. And the first part was you would go down and they would humiliate you, they'd pull all your clothes off you, and that was a big part of it, to make you humiliated, to, to, to remove any sense of dignity you had. So they would strip you naked, and then they would pull you over a big rock or a table, and then they would whip you with a big, um, whip with um, pieces of lead and metal and stuff and they would then tear your skin off your back and then they would then tear your muscle off your back all the way down to your bones on your back. And the idea was not to kill you but to get you just with a couple of inches of your life. With Jesus they stuck a big crown on his head, with the, the thorns were about two inches long and the, the cutting in the, in the brows you can bleed a lot. And so the idea was, number one, to humiliate him as a fake king, and then also to increase the loss of blood. What we also know is that they usually didn't carry a cross quite like this. They would just carry the cross beam. Sometimes it went on the top, and sometimes it looked like this one, and they would then tie him to it, and he would carry it to the place of crucifixion. In Jerusalem, there are two possible places, and both of them are fairly long walk. And while he was walking, people would throw stones at him, people would mock him. Like, if you're Jesus, if you're God, why can't you get the angels to save you? Um, and, and that's what they call the Mira Dolorosa, but they, 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 they really were there trying to humiliate him. They'd kick him over from time to time, just to make sure that he knew that he was on his way to his death. What's interesting in Jesus' crucifixion is about, just about, before he gets there, there's an African gentleman that is called to help Jesus carry this cross for the last couple of hundred yards. 
and he really does it reluctantly because he's scared that they might crucify him along with Jesus because that's just how the Romans were. Now I don't know about you, but I'm going to like to talk to that man too and ask him what it felt like to help Jesus carry his cross. In all of the Bible, I only know one man who helped Jesus carry his cross and he did it reluctantly. When you read about the disciples, all of them, even to the last one, ran away and hid. Peter, James, John, all of them. The only people that stuck around even close was his mother, Mary, Magdalena, and a few of the women. So when men tell me how tough and they are, you know, I think probably not. The women were a lot tougher and a lot stronger than the men. They didn't care. They really loved Jesus at a level that they were willing to risk their lives. Obviously, Peter denied Jesus three times. Then they would take you and hang you. Uh, now, one, some people said they hung him on a tree and they took this cross and they hung him on it. And the way they would do that was, number one, is they would hammer two of your parts of your arm on the one side and then they would lay you down and then they would yank your shoulders out of joint. How many of you ever played baseball and ever tore your muscles back behind your shoulder blade? Okay, they would do that on both sides for sole purpose to make it very painful when you're on the cross. Because once you're on the cross, the way they hung you made it hard for you to breathe. So to breathe, you had to pull yourself up to breathe and then you would let yourself down. And then you had to have your feet nailed to the cross. And so you had to push up on these nails and at the same time pull up on these broken parts of your body. And remembering that also your ribs are probably broken, you have holes in your lungs and you were probably suffocating already. So people knew how hard and terrible the cross was. And Jesus died pretty shortly. A lot of people lived on the cross for weeks, days, trying to find some relief. And the only relief you get was your death. And they would beg people to kill them before they died. They, 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 they were looking for any kind of relief. And most people didn't. They just threw stuff at them and laughed at them and made fun of them. And what did Jesus say? Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. Can you see why not too many people would take us on that kind of living? In fact, we read in some of the early writings that many Christians went as martyrs to the uh, theater. How many of you watched Gladiator, the movie, and you watched the Christians in there? Well, there's had some actual writings and they would say, you know, dear Jesus, we're glad that we're getting to die for you, but come quickly and make it quick because we don't want to be tortured. And Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. And so I share that with you because sometimes we see people tell you that if you become a Christian, your life's going to be easy and it's going to be great. But it's not what Jesus says. Jesus says that there are people that will tease you. There are people that are going to make fun of you. People are going to insult your intelligence and say all sorts of mean things about you because you're following Jesus. If they did it to Jesus, they're going to do it to us. But I know some of the most intelligent people in the world that follow Jesus. Some of the strongest people in the world that follow Jesus. Some of the meekest and kindest people in the world that follow Jesus in spite of what's happened to them. I come from South Africa to teach people about Jesus. But in Northern Africa, above Kenya, in places like Malawi, Nigeria, Ethiopia, there's a strong Muslim presence. And they do not like Christians. In fact, there's actually warlords over there, and very often they will take the priest or the preacher and put them over the altar and say, this is your preacher, look, he's dying for you, just like Jesus, and they would kill them. There's many, many stories about churches that are boarded up and set in fire with all the Christians in them, in the name of Jesus. And Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. Sometimes I wonder how many people would be willing to die for Jesus. If somebody came in 
to the room, kind of like that um, shooting they had at Columbine, and they asked the little girl, are you a Christian? And she said yes, then she got shot. If somebody put your face on that kind of line, what would you tell them? Another way of saying it is, somebody accused you of being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? And Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. But there's another scripture that goes with this. Jesus said, if you take my yoke upon you, my yoke is easy and light, and that nothing you go through in life, I won't give you the grace and strength to go through with it. And so, sometimes we will face some of the most difficult things in our life, terminal cancer, people being mean to us, people bullying us. But the beautiful thing is, Jesus comes up next to us and give us the emotional and psychological and church strength, you know, when your people come by and support us, the strength to go and be able to deal with some of the most painful and difficult things in life. And I think that that's just been a comfort to me. My life has not always been easy. I've been teased about many things in my life. Uh, I've had to endure some things in my life. And I always thought my life was hard. How about you? Have you felt like your cross has kind of been more than you can handle sometimes? Well, I have a story to add to that. One day, I took my little cross to Jesus and I said, Jesus, my cross is too much. I'm tired of being a poor preacher. I'm tired of having cancer. I'm tired of preaching to people that never listen to me. And when I get through, they tell me you did a good preaching sermon, but I knew they were sleeping because I could yell them snoring. <laughs> I am. I'm just tired. I'm tired of my cooking for my family and they never like my cooking anyway. Uh, I'm tired of my cat when I put out food and she just kicks it away. Uh, I'm tired of my cat, you know, when I give her all the loving and care and she goes and spends all the time with my daughter. And just, and life ain't fair. So Jesus said, well, come on in and you can swap your cross out. And I went into the cross room and saw a bunch of them there. I saw Jesus's and all covered in the blood of the world and I said, no, I'm taking Jesus cross. That's just too much cross for me. So then I looked over at Peter's and uh, he was uh, got bird marks on it and seen where he'd been martyred and beat up and, uh, and I said, no, I'm not taking Peter's cross. He, my, I have the same name, but I don't want Peter's cross. I went and looked at old Paul's cross and there he'd been crucified upside down and beaten. I saw where his hands had become like whips. I seen where his back had been fused together from all the torture where he'd been left for dead and drowned and everything else. So now I had the cross in for me. And I went and looked at different people's crosses. I looked at some of your crosses. And I said, no, nah, that's too much cross for me. I, I, I like a small cross. I'm going to find me the smallest cross I can find. And I hunted and I hunted and I hunted. Finally, I found a tiny little cross. I said, Jesus, I'll take that cross. And Jesus said, yeah, but that's the cross you brought in. <laughs> and so I leave you with this. There's no matter how big or small your cross is, Jesus knows what you're going through. Jesus knows about your fears. Jesus knows about your hurts and your pain. Jesus knows when people tease you. Jesus knows when people challenge you for your faith. And he will give you the grace and the people to help you through it. Last story. I wasn't going to preach this one, but I think it might be good. This was more for teenagers, just looking over the crowd. My son used, and I think I've shared the story one time before. My son went to high school, and you know the Bible says, you know, if you uh, want to be a good Christian, somebody wants to beat you up, hit you on your left cheek, turn your right cheek. Well, that, that's just not going to go over in high school too good, is it? Right? Or so somebody kind of calls you names, I'm not going to go names. Well, my son was going through some of that, and this tiny little, tiny little boy, same grade as him, I, I, I would use a pipsqueak, but then in a Christian sense. <laughs> but he um, came up, I want to pick a fight with him, and my son said, look, I don't want to fight you. You know, I'm trying to be, you know, respectful of my dad's profession, and this, that, and the other. So one day he was sitting in the cafeteria, and this guy walked up, took his fork and jabbed it into his um, 
chicken nuggets. That's what they called it at the school that time. You know, some people say it's a mystery meat. You don't know what chicken nuggets are. And so he looked at this, and he just said, yeah, you know, just eat my chicken nuggets. I, I, I'm done, you know. So the guy says, well, you want to make something of this? My, my son said, no, I don't want to fight you. I just want to be left alone. And so the guy bowed up and threw a punch at him. And my son grabbed his hand. And my son, six foot seven, I got size 17 shoe at the time. So he had a small boy. He just skinny and lanky. And so be careful when you pick on a skinny, lanky man. And he held his hand like Peter Rabbit in the Briar Patch. That's another movie you can't get anymore. And he threw his other fist. And my son grabbed both his fists. And you could see my son had lost it because he started to shake with anger. And he brought the boy down to his knees, just about. And he said, I don't want to fight you. But if you keep this up, I'm going to hurt you. And just then, one of the coaches came running up and grabbed my son and told him to go sit off and calm down. And that other boy got um, two weeks out of school suspension. And I always keep that in mind because my son, I always haven't seen eye to eye, but I have the utmost respect for my son and his ability to control his temper, which I struggle with. Because I would have picked a fight and hit and laid hands on him in a Christian way, but... <laughs> But that's not what happened. And so I share this with young boys and young people in school, that there are ways to deal with that. And just because Jesus calls us to turn the other cheek, it doesn't mean we have to be a whipping post for others. Women, particularly women, but also men, we're not supposed to be the whipping post of our spouse. If you've been beat up, by somebody, you don't have to put up with that. You can leave. Jesus doesn't expect that from us. But what Jesus does expect from us is to love those who don't know how to control themselves in way that boy is parents, because he came over to me and started giving me a hard time about that incident. And I said, I think I know where your mother goes to work. She was a post office, and every day I saw her. So I went and said to her, I said, you know, your son's giving me a hard time. I'd like to see him and your father, his father. So they came to the church and we had a discussion. And after that, he became one of my biggest friends. He became a lot more polite because he realized I wasn't going to let it go. And that I had enough care and love in my heart to show him discipline and to show him a different way of being. Children of God. God calls us to take up our cross and follow Him. I'm telling you, it's not going to be easy. You will bump into difficult people and situations in your life. But I will tell you this, that if you allow Jesus to walk with you, He definitely will make it easier for you. Now with that said, I can't beat with that sermon right over there in the corner. That was one of the cutest amens I've ever heard. So thank you so much. I enjoyed that just as much as I was talking. Let us close in prayer. Dear Lord, I want to thank you for being there as I carry my cross. I want to thank you for babies in the church because they definitely make life exciting and they remind us that there is a future and a tomorrow and there are new beginnings. So Lord, we ask that you bless us, be with us as we go into our last song, allow us to experience the joy and also the struggle of carrying a cross. Amen. Thank you again for joining us today. Uh, remember, uh, we're going to leave straight from here and go to KJ's house. Anybody that's interested, just follow the group. And again, try and carpool if you can. Uh, please stand as we close out the service.
baptism this morning. We talked a little bit about the cross. Um, but I know some of you might have been daydreaming or sleeping or playing with the baby. But wherever your heart or mind was, you had these words. That God's love and God's grace. It's okay to play with babies. It's greater than all the evil and brokenness in the world. And God's love and God's grace is creating all the brokenness and hurt in me and in you. Go in that knowledge in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.